did. I looked at a lot of different paths, the ways that I could spend my t- my time and money. And real estate really resonated for me because it was something I could do without leaving my W two job and get it up and working for a while. And I had control over it. I liked that path. And you know, most people in real estate are following something fairly similar. Welcome to the Path to Wealth, the show about well-being, fulfillment, and financial freedom. And I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. Welcome back to the Path to Wealth. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. In today's episode, we have the privilege of hearing from John Tadarat, a name that's from Norwegia, I just learned, an accomplished software engineer turned multifamily syndicator and investor. He's also the founder of Cardinal Oak Investments, overseeing apartment properties in Washington, South Carolina, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Committed to financial education for individuals of diverse backgrounds, John specializes in guiding tech professionals who may not envision a clear path to financial freedom. He's also the author of the ebook From Tech to Fire through Multifamily. Thank you for being with us, John. Hannes, thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to to talk with you and to share with you a few of my experiences and hopefully uh, some insights and and things I've done right and things I've maybe not done so right and and um, look forward to the conversation. So let's start. Um, where did your money mindset come from? Is it something that got nurtured in the family, or is it something that came into life over, over the years that you noticed that being an employee maybe won't get you the lifestyle that you were looking for? Well, um, I, the money mindset, I, I don't think it started with any one particular event. I knew from a very young age that um, I wanted to be able to to live comfortably and afford the things that I wanted. And, and so my my path through grade school was, was um you know, doing the things I was told to do and, and, um, doing my homework and, and getting decent grades and, and following that course, I realized at a young age that I had, a, um, an aptitude for, uh, for, for technical things and particularly math and putting things together and, and assembling. And so I kind of followed that path out of, out of high school and into college, a degree in computer science. And I thought, ah, oh, computer science and, um, I'll get a job with computer science. And, and it was, it's true. I mean, it's tr- still true today. And it was especially true back then. You get a job and then you're making decent money. And it was always an appreciation for, I, I want to know that I'm working hard and, and making money. And then, you know, you, you're making, you're making a living. You're living a comfortable life. You're doing the things that you want. You've got, you've got a, um, a work life balance, so to speak. I mean, I, Anybody in technology is is um is going to tell you that they're expected to work some pretty long hours, and I was no exception. Uh, after a while, you start seeing things that you realize I could do better. I could do more than what I'm doing, and I have the skills and the interest and motivation to work toward that. And so, so you start thinking of different paths, and and for me, I um. I mean, my paths went toward having a W two job mostly, and then I had my own business for a while, and then um, my own business did not set me up as I expected for retirement. I couldn't just sell the business and and um, and and retire to Fiji. I had to uh, continue working, and which was okay. I had skills and and I enjoyed my work, and I continued doing that. But along that path, I I realized I I want to find something that that does set me up and you know I put a lot of my income off toward the 401k 401k was um was a great tool but it wasn't really getting me toward retirement I I studied stock trading and and tried to time the market and all of that and it worked okay for a while and then it didn't and and you follow the market and things things work well and then they don't and I realized you know I have some abilities that that I don't think that I'm really tapping into well enough 
And I looked for a way to, to leverage them and real estate became it. I looked at a lot of different paths, the ways that I could spend my, my time and money and real estate really resonated for me because it was something I could do without leaving my W2 job and get it up and working for a while. And I had control over it. And I, I liked that path. And, and, you know, most people in real estate are following something fairly similar. It's like real estate. Okay. I can put my, put my hands on it and I can touch it and feel it. And I can, I can have a say in how it runs. Maybe I'm not the direct property manager, but at least I have a say. And so from a money mindset, that was where, um, that was where my heart took me and my skills and I started applying it from that point. So what was your first real estate investment that you picked? Um, I, I, uh, I, I was looking at single family homes. The answer to your question is I, I bought a three unit and a four unit, but I wasn't initially um, thinking of that. <laughs> I was thinking of single family homes and went to the little seminars about fix and flip. And, and they, they show you, they show you pictures of uh, the presenter is, is there on a tropical beach and, and with a big boat and all this stuff and said, well, this is what you can do too. And I said, wow, that's for me. And, and so I was real interested and, and I uh, caught the real estate bug and I initially was thinking of fixing and flipping, buying a house and fixing it up and maybe even wholesaling or those, those kinds of things. Things. And, and as I got further into it, I realized this is a lot of work and I, um, and it's a one time payoff and you, you do a good job of fixing it up and you sell it and you make some money and then you move on to the next one. Um, there are a couple problems is that it wasn't really a long term, uh, source of income, like passive income was one of, one of my goals. And it wasn't one of my skills. I mean, it wasn't something that I knew well. I, I, uh, I, I've done some nominal fix up of homes that I've lived in and uh, minor, minor little projects and jobs around the house. And, and I, I can find my way around fixing things around the house, but I was not into construction. I did not know construction and I did not know estimating. And I, and I, um, it, it was something I was willing and able to learn, but I realized, um, I could get really caught up in this and, and make a couple of early mistakes that are too costly to continue. And so I, um, for various reasons, I chose not to do that. Um, and I want to be cautious because I know a lot of people who do that and have been very successful who have started that way. And it's a great path. I mean, it really is a, uh, a terrific way to try and to learn and to make some decent money. And I know a lot of people who have done that, particularly people who don't have a lot of their own initial capital to invest in something, do in something like wholesaling. Um, a great start. I, I, um, I, if that's the path you chose, then then um, hopefully you're making it work. For me, it wasn't the right path. I I chose to find uh, properties that that I could make passive income from and hold and improve the value. And I I wasn't expert in it at the time. I um, I didn't know a lot about it, but I did know that I could figure things out. And so I bought into I mean, I, I, this is right after the 2008 recession. There's a lot of properties coming in, onto the market. Um, I mean, a lot, 2008 properties and 2009, the properties were coming back to the banks. They weren't necessarily going back on the market, but they were coming to the banks and the banks are just overwhelmed. All these, these, you know, you go to work for a bank and you think, you, I want to work in, in a desk job and in the finance department or writing loans and stuff. And suddenly your job is managing properties and they don't know how to do that. And they held a lot of properties and, you know, the real estate and REO business, all this work in banks that they were not equipped to handle. Um, a lot of properties just stagnated and banks accumulated real estate and, and, um, and, you know, over time, they got it back on the market. They put it back into brokers' hands and they sold it. And there were short sales is what they called them, there, um, where the sale price was for less than what the original owner owed on it. The loan was for more than what they were able to sell it for. And so I picked up some properties that way and they were good deals. Um, there were tenants in them, not necessarily in great condition because the owner wasn't spending any money fixing these up or responding to tenant calls and and the owner had sort of turned the keys back over to the banks and so they were there was some work to be done i bought them and some empty units uh, did a lot of fixing myself found people to fix them up and then figured things out like writing a lease 
How do I know the lease is legal? What's the lease need to contain? And looking that stuff up, talking to people who knew, finding myself some some networks to go to real estate meetups and talk to people and learned it little by little, how to find tenants, how to set the rent, how to make improvements, how to find handymen and how to find other skilled trades and and gradually found good tenants, got the income up and stabilized these properties and built up equity. I mean, you build up income, you build up equity. And so I could I I had those properties. I was not really of the mindset of I'm going to buy this and hold it forever. A lot of people do. And again, um, a lot of people have become very successful. It's like never sell. I don't ever sell anything. Maybe they refinance. Well, that was not me. I do sell and I wanted to tap the equity and I wanted to um, to move on to bigger properties. I did not want to hold these forever. And so I sold them and bought bigger properties. And I've I've kind of progressed from there buying larger properties and and yeah, into syndicating over the, over the years, but started off with these small properties as I know a lot of people do. So for somebody who's in tech, I don't know, making maybe six figures or like has a decent income and wants to venture into real estate, how would you, after having all of this experience now, help them or maybe guide them on what would be a good transition to becoming an investor? It, yes, um, for technology people, um, it, there there are several things that they have to be aware of and focused on. Um, one is managing their time. They need to find the time in the day and weekends and whatever to do real estate. And and um, it's not always easy. It, it's not always the same. My the answer for me is not going to be the answer for other people. For me, it was I, I'm a morning person. I can get up earlier and and spend more time on it. A couple hours before I had to go off to work. I um, and I'm not in a W two job now anymore. Fortunately, I retired a couple of years ago and I do real estate full time. But um, when when I was in the W two job, yeah, I do it early in the morning. And and the jobs are there are several jobs. It, you know, you, you want to get out of the mode of being the property manager yourself. You you want to be an asset manager. It doesn't mean you don't start off that way. Maybe you buy a small property and you are managing it and you're you're finding your own tenants and then you're placing ads for tenants and you're responding to the ads and you figure figure out the fact that if a tenant makes an inquiry to your ad, you need to respond quickly because that tenant's just run or prospective tenant is running down through a list of apartments they found in your area and they are top of mind people. And whoever responded to them are the people that they engage in conversations with, and it's one of them that they'll rent from. If you're a day or two late in responding to somebody like that, you've lost it. And so you got to figure out how to respond to somebody pretty quickly within minutes, if not an hour or two. If somebody looking for, you know, just figuring those things out. If you're buying properties, then you've got to you have broker conversations at at a, at an hour a time a time of day when the broker's in and around not at six or seven in the morning which yeah, they do which, usually business hours brokers are not available to you unless you're a big client of them from previous transactions they don't make themselves available to you on the weekends yeah, yes. Well, the other thing is, um, for me, I mean, initially I was looking for properties in my state of Washington and, you know, same time zone. That was kind of challenging. Once I own properties in another part of the state, not very close to me, where I was not the property manager, I, had, I, I bought their large enough properties where I had a professional property manager in there, I realized I could own properties anywhere in the U.S., I don't need to own them right in like two or three hours away. And so then I started, I I was more deliberate about the markets that I chose. And I, I went to conferences and I took classes and I learned this material. And I mean, I learned about how to choose a market and how to look for markets. And I and I used that information and I found markets, but I found them in other parts of the country that were further east. And so for me, getting up in the morning, I could pick up the phone at, at um, six or seven in the morning and they're they're already at work at, at eight or nine or 10 or whatever in the morning. And I could take advantage of my hours in the morning to talk to people who were already at work. And granted, you make a phone call to a broker, they don't recognize the name on the caller ID. 
they are probably not going to take the call. You leave them a message, they call you back later in the morning <laughs> when you're at work. And so that's another thing you have to figure out is when you get calls during the day, how are you going to answer them? Can you step away from your desk? Can you allocate a time period like your mid-morning break or your lunch hour or something like that where you make these calls? That's the, the kind of thing a, a tech person has to figure out is, is um, your time in the day. And then you've got a lot of heads down work um, you know, do, doing your underwriting, a broker sends you a property. They're sending you financials, a rent roll, and a, a T twelve or or you know, profit and loss statement, and and you've got to figure out is this a good deal or not. And you're in, entering information into your underwriting model, your spreadsheet, or you're looking at that and assessing is this a good deal or not. That takes time. I mean, there are back of the napkin calculations that you can do. Um, I don't put a lot of trust in those. You got to spend some time and and make a more informed assessment on whether this is a good deal or not. And so maybe you do that on the weekends or maybe your evenings or maybe you have young kids and you put them to bed at seven or eight at night and you then you sit down for another couple hours. Whatever works for you, you got to find the time. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is you're a technology professional. You're good at analyzing things. You're good at looking at something and thinking about it for a while. And if you're a coder, which is what I was, you're. it's like putting a puzzle together. You got to think about it for a while and you're writing something down that is the result of you having figured this out or you're studying something to find a problem, it takes time. You've got to have quiet time, doors closed, and thinking about it, you're analyzing. And that's what you're doing as an engineer, software, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, whatever your technology profession is, or even accounting and finance, or not even, not you don't even... You don't have a college degree, but you're in a an advanced technology business. You're an accountant. You're doing engineering designs or drawings or or something. And you've taken you've taken coding classes, and and you're a professional. Or um, I don't mean to say a bachelor or master's degree in these these technical fields. You're you're a technology professional because you have studied and become good at what you're doing, regardless of how you got there. You're a professional, but your aptitude is one of analyzing and thinking about it. And the danger there is overanalyzing and thinking about it too long. And you're thinking, oh, I can do this in real estate. I can look at all this information that, that the broker is going to send me in. And I, I, um, I know how to set it up just perfectly in a spreadsheet. And I know how to, how to get the right answer and figure out rates of return and all of that stuff. And, and you start doing that. The problem that, that you might have that I've seen very often is that you're analyzing it to death and you don't want to do that. The term is um, uh, paralysis by analysis. I mean, it's a common term. You just don't want to get yourself caught up into that. And the reason is because you've got to move on it. You've, you've got to understand that in real estate, it's not going to be perfect. There are no perfect properties. It's not going to perfectly line up with all your analysis. You got to get to a point where you can make a decision and move. Um, otherwise, somebody else is going to move faster than you. And that awesome deal that you just saw is going to pass you by because you took too much time on it. And so you've got to figure that figure that part of it out. Also, there are some other things that certainly tech people have to do, but those are a couple of the big ones. So, so you mentioned one you don't trust back of the napkin. And on the other end of the spectrum, you also don't want to overanalyze. So how do you find the sweet spot where you move with confidence and close a deal uh, without, you know, just having done some some back of the napkin underwriting? Um, for me, it started with something that was way more comprehensive and complicated than I could use long term. I I thought, oh, I gotta I gotta aggregate all of this information that I've received from the broker or or maybe other sources as well and i've got to consolidate it into a spreadsheet and and enter it all in and until it tells me you know projections for the first year that i own it projections for the second year how are my rent assumptions and what if i change these assumptions and those kinds of things and it it took a long time and 
I did it for, I, I did that process for virtually all of the properties that I analyzed. It limited me to a high degree because there's only so many of those that you can do in a certain amount of time. You, you have reasonably good deal flow, but you can't, you can't take it all in. You can't process it. And so little by little, I was able to improve those processes. First, you do it right. You do what you need to do to get the right answer. Then you improve the process. You make it more efficient. You realize what information is really not that critical to um, you coming into a go no go decision. How do I want to take the next step on this property or not? Do I know enough now that I um, I need to walk away? I need to move off of this and and on to the next one. That's the kind of direction that you need to go. The quick rules of thumb. Two uh, percent rule or whatever, whatever you happen to use, it's a bad idea. I mean, I just don't, I don't follow them. I don't think that's the right direction to go. You miss too much. You're going to walk away from too many deals that could have been good opportunities. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. So, um, where else? Again, I'm a six figure employee. I'm trying to get into yeah. real estate. I'm wrapping my head around those basics. Where else do you think I have to look to get my first deal done? What, what can I do? Uh, you get, getting your first deal um, to get your first deal, you need to have relationships and you need to be you need to know people who are further along than you are. The team is critical. I mean, it's not necessarily I need to have people who will invest with me yet. I mean, it depends on the kind of deal that you want. If you want to buy something that requires more of a down payment than what you have yourself or what you want to invest uh, then yes, you need a team. If you want something small, um, like what I did, 5, 10, 20 units, you can certainly do that on your own, but you need to have people who um, uh, maybe they're mentors, but as a minimum, they know more than you. They have more experience than you, and they're willing to take a phone call from you that they can help you through through difficult situations or over hurdles or answer questions. And maybe you pay for that service. Maybe it's a, a coaching service. Um, I wouldn't get an expensive coaching service too early, but but um, maybe there are people who will share their experience with you. I think that's important is to know that to get into your first deal. You might want to join somebody else's deal. Um, that's a great option for a lot of people to get started. It's like, I, I've got skills that I can offer. What? Um, how can I join you in your deal? And maybe they say, oh, you can put money into my deal. And that's certainly one way, but um, it, does, it shouldn't have to be the only way. Um, whatever your profession, I guarantee you've got skills that are applied to to real estate, and I and I've I've thought about this a lot. There's there's skills from virtually every profession that apply somehow to real estate, and it's up to you to figure out what they are and to be able to capitalize on them. And that kind of brings me to the other thing that technology professionals don't do well enough, and that's marketing and marketing um, themselves, their experience, and what they do. They're thinking of solving a problem and analyzing something. They're uh, probably not that proficient with marketing yet. And the people who succeed in real estate have gotten good at that. They're not shy anymore. They're not introverts. I mean, they maybe they still are introverts, but they've they've gotten past that. They've figured out a way of that. I, I can't do this in a vacuum. I need to talk to people. I need to be put myself out there and learn from other people. And I need to market Meaning that I need to talk about what I do. I'm in the teaching profession. I've led, I've led um, uh, organizations, or or I, I've I've mastered this style of talking as a teacher, or I'm a fireman, or I'm a law enforcement, or or I I'm um, in accounting. I mean, all of those it's such applicable experiences that that um, you can bring to real estate and. And, and it, you know, to, to kind of step into a whole another discussion is um, finding your deal is about talking to people who know about deals. And that's mainly brokers. I mean, a lot of people are successful doing searches around certain geographies of give me all the properties. I mean, talk to a title company and give me a list of properties that are between 10 and 40 units. That or something, and then finding the owners of them and calling the owners, reaching out to them and seeing them interested in your property or however that goes. I've not had success doing that. It's not the path I follow, but a lot of people do, and so maybe that's what you want to do. And uh, but for me, it's talking to brokers. 
developing relationships, understanding them, making sure they know what you're looking for, calling them back, uh, making sure they know that you're qualified and credible, that you can perform, that you can close a deal. Those are different options that I would recommend. So for somebody who's new, how do they deepen those relationships as a broker? I mean, uh, especially very experienced brokers, there obviously there's market cycled. And in 2020, the experienced brokers weren't taking calls from newbies. And then maybe in 2023 and 2022, it was a lot more likely that they're taking calls because the volume was was down. But uh, overall, how do you how would you suggest somebody builds those relationships with a broker? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny how that how that changes. And I've I've had the same experiences. Is that brokers when the market is is as good as it was in 2020 and 2021, then brokers are just overwhelmed. They they have owners who want to list the property. They've owned it for two years and haven't done a thing to it. And now they want to list it for 50 percent more than what they bought it for. And and somebody's there to buy it. And um, it's crazy. And brokers just had a lot of those transactions. And you're a new buyer and say, hey, I want to get in on the action. You talk to the broker and say, I'm looking for properties. And the broker is very selective. They only have so much time in the day and they have to be fairly picky. It's nothing against them. They have to they have to be um, uh, judicious about who they choose to work with. And and it's sometimes hard to get their attention. And yes, it has changed in the last year or so. Brokers, um, especially if you've had relationships with brokers and you're not talking to them on a real regular basis, they're starting to call you back. Um, it's great how it's changed. It's more of a buyer's market and brokers, um, they, they want to represent properties and they also want to find buyers. And so um, the answer to your question is, is that you have to be reaching out to brokers and you have to, you have to be talking to them, engaging with them on a regular basis. And so you find a, find brokers for an area, um, several ways of doing it, but we want to find commercial. And for me, it's multifamily, um, multifamily brokers. Um, if you're looking for office space, re- I'm sorry, office buildings, uh, retail, industrial, storage, mobile home parks, whatever ha- the asset class happens to be, there are brokers who specialize in that. And you want for multifamily, you want a broker who knows multifamily, and and um, and it's not always easy to find out who they are. You're going to talk to a lot of brokers. You you um you kind of narrow it down based on conversations to a few of them, and and you make sure they know what you're looking for, the size of property, the condition or age or other attributes of that property like do you want a do you not want a flat roof do you want pitched roof only or do you um uh do you want it to be in the city or out in a rural area or uh do you want it to be almost full occupancy or do you like like it to be well you know whatever you're looking for you need to tell the broker and make sure you're clear um the brokers if you know most of the brokers will listen to you and have a conversation and they'll and they'll be very um very considerate of your time and and your request then whether they follow up or not and do anything for you is another question you if it's your first time talking with them you have to call them back in a little while maybe two or three weeks or so and say hey we talked about this and we talked about that and um and and even point out something you remember from your conversation about them like um their their personal life they're a football fan do they have kids you know whatever you happen to pick up you want to to try to make that personal contact you've got your second conversation and they're saying well I haven't seen anything yet but I got my ear to the ground or li- I'm still listening to all that and and that's great um good conversation but you keep doing it not every two weeks but maybe every month or so every four to six weeks reminding them then when they send you a property saying how about this one do you think you might like this one you give them a response you need to follow up with that email within within a day less than a day and say, I like it because of this reason, and I'm looking at it in more detail. I like this app attribute or this that, that attribute or, or of these other things. Um, here are the thing, here's something I'm concerned about. Or if you pass on it, and you know, we all do this all the time. Is you look at it, a property and something about it you don't like. Um, I I respond to the broker with that and saying, look, um, 
the, this owner did a great job of getting the rents up. They did renovations and the rents are up and, and, and good for them, for them. Um, but the rents are at market rate rents and there's not much that I can do with it. <laughs> and for me, I'm a value add buyer. I like to know that there's something I can do with these units. I can invest in renovations in them and, and get the rents up. And if I don't see that opportunity, I'm just going to let the broker know. And the broker doesn't know otherwise. I mean, they're not, I'm not asking the broker to send me, oh, it's got to be at least this cap rate or, or the, there's got to be a rent differential of at least this amount. I don't, I don't say any of that because I need to do that in that kind of research and analysis myself. Um, the owner's not going to um, do that analysis. Seller, they're not going to do that analysis. The broker does a cap rate analysis, maybe, but, but, um, it, it's probably not the way that I do it. And so I don't ask for that information. I just, I'm more general. I, I like to see properties. Then you need to respond to them. It's through that process, that engagement process that you develop the relationships with brokers. And, and it's not going to be all the brokers that you initially talked to, and it might only be a handful. And so gradually you're, you're getting a better relationship with brokers and, then you get better properties sent. And, and um, if a property looks like something you might like, you need to be ready to submit a letter of intent, an LOI for it, and to make the, and to make the offer. That's a hard step for a lot of people to make. Um, that sort of gets the ball rolling. And are you ready for that ball to be rolling? Or do you have other things lined up? Do you know where your loan's coming from? Do you have investors if you need them? Do you have the down payment? Are you going to have money to to hire an attorney to to make legal paperwork? Are you going to have money to have, hire an inspector? Do you have all that stuff lined up? Get it lined up before you submit your LOI. Um, but once you got it lined up, you got to get your LOIs, your offers out there for them, to those brokers. Yeah. Once it's rolling, it's rolling. You can't back up. Otherwise, you're actually burning the relationship with the broker. So true. Yes. It's a difficult thing to do. And you don't want to do that. You want those relationships. Yeah. You cannot, like, once you get to the point where the broker brought you the deal and the ball is rolling, you better get the financing straight because otherwise that broker will never put your name forth again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're buying a property and you know you've got, um, you've got cash available, um, maybe it's a smaller property and only requires uh $100,000 or $200,000. You've got some cash. You've saved up some money and um, and you don't want it to be your last $200,000. You want to have plenty of money left over. You don't want to be putting all your savings into one property. Don't ever do that. Um, or into one investment, really. I mean, it's, you've got to diversify this to a certain degree. Um, um, but once if you've got all the money, uh, then maybe you're ready to go. And... Um, Maybe you feel more secure about taking that step. Like I was saying before, you do need to have other people you can call on to as a sanity check, as somebody who can validate your underwriting, who can confirm that you're not making some big mistake when you're early and you haven't done this before or much before. Um, there are a lot of ways of making mistakes and you need to learn from other people who have made the mistakes so that you're not making them yourself. You've, you put a large chunk of money into your first deal and the deal goes bad, you might not have any more deals. It might affect your lifestyle for a long time into the future. And so you gotta understand that and be ready to solve the problems as, as they arise with that property. Um, if you're teaming up with other people, you want people who have at least the amount of experience that you have. If you're starting off new, You've got some friends who you think you're, the friends are smart and they're willing to put a little bit of their money into it too, but they've not bought any real estate themselves either. You're thinking collectively you'll, you'll solve the problems. Um, don't bet on it. You need people on your team who have experience and you'll give them a little bit sh bigger share of the equity as a result. You need to do that. And um, you need to to buy a property with people who are more experienced with you. I mean, anything in real estate, you want to do it with people that are further along than you are as much as you can. And that's not always reasonable because they're looking at you and thinking, who are you? What are you going to add to this deal? What value do you add? What's your experience? 
And um, they've got a good point. You might not be as experienced, but that's where you got to put your marketing hat on and say, I can do this and I can do that. And, and besides, I'm not, I'm not taking up much of the equity. And be, be assertive and be confident that you have value to add to that deal. And join a deal that of somebody else's or put, put together your own deal, but, but realize that you got to keep that ball rolling. You got to get into that deal, even if it's a small one. Um, not a bad deal, of course, but um, if it's a good deal, don't get cold feet and walk away just because. Uh, don't be super creative about finding the reasons not to go forward in this deal. And that's a common roadblock for new investors is that, I mean, any of us can do this. There's always something that we can look at. This is, here's the problem. I'm not going to go forward. Well, it could easily be have been a problem that you could solve. And so don't get caught up in that trap either. It's just, uh, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of different pieces of, of general advice that we've all gone through and bought a few properties and we've faced this ourselves and it's something not to do in the future. Yeah. It, it takes a little bit of time, you know, we're learning the ropes, uh, getting comfortable with the lingo, you know, meeting people and the more conversations one has, uh, the more second nature it will become. You mentioned yes. lifestyle in between. And, and I think at the end of the day, we, we all become investors for lifestyle reasons. And one of my favorite questions is, what do you consider a life well lived? A, a life in, unlived is is um, choices that you were thinking about earlier in your life that you uh, you chose not to do and you regret. Um, <clears throat> I uh, I I'm about adventures and experiences and trying things that I haven't done, finding things that I've enjoyed doing. Uh, for me, it's focused on the outdoors. I, I really like the out, outdoor experiences and and keep myself in good physical shape so that I can enjoy them. And I enjoy being with people who do the same thing. And so it's those experiences. And I'm blessed to live in a in an area that um, where where uh, there are a lot of, of like minded people in my area, Western Washington, the greater Seattle area. I'm not in the city of Seattle, but I'm just kind of outside Seattle. And Washington has, you know, has more to offer than virtually every, any other state. I mean, there are mountains and water and desert and rivers and lakes. And there's something for everybody here. And, and, and that's what I enjoy. That's, that is a life well lived is experiencing the, out, the outdoors. Now, having said that, um, I, I've also had an aptitude for sitting down and, and learning things that take a long time to learn. And I've done that mainly through music and I still do it through music, but also um, through martial arts and some other activities that, that you do it. And after, after your first year, you're, <laughs> you're not much better than when you started. It just takes a long time to learn. And so those are the kinds of things that, that I, that I enjoy is like having done it for a long time. I like looking back and say, I spent a lot of time getting good at this particular thing, whatever it happens to be. And um, that to me is rich and rewarding and, and um, something I can feel a lot of satisfaction about. And it comes to family also. The raising a family is so rewarding and something that everybody uh, would no, I shouldn't say that. I, uh, some people, I was going to say everybody should do it. Everybody should raise a family. And that's certainly not true. Raising a family is not for everybody. And, and it's just a rich and rewarding experience that that um, I have had that um, is right at the top of my life experiences. At the top, and it'll never be any different. Um, it's just so rewarding. I'm so glad that I did it. And everything about my life is... is um, is better because I've done that. And so having a family and having, having a close family is rewarding to me as well. Yeah. I, I think family time and, uh, you know, really creating memories together. That's it's such deeply meaningful time spent together. Yes. Yes. So where can people connect with you? I can be connected in a number of different ways. You can find me on, on LinkedIn, John Totterud on Instagram again, John Totterud and, and uh, on um, my website is cardinaloke.com. An easy way to to learn about what I do and how I can maybe help people along a little better is through uh, learnaboutapartments.com. Learnaboutapartments.com. That is uh, my website. And 
you can connect with me. You can find informational sources and uh, subscribe to my newsletter. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, investing with me, uh, that information is there as well. Um, and so learnaboutapartments.com is a good place, first place to start. Awesome, John. Thank you very much for making the time and um, you know sharing sharing how to go from a six-figure tech income to basically being a multifamily real estate investor on a larger scale. Thank you, Hannes. Wonderful to talk with you and, and good to uh, uh, be able to share with your listeners a little more about what we do. And hopefully we've um, helped some folks take another step on their real estate journey. Thank you for joining us at The Path to Wealth. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Check out our upcoming guests and be sure to share it with all your friends and family that want to take their life to the next level of wealth. <laughs>